Today we're going to talk about uh, the latest uh, recovery volume. Um, it's uh, Matthew Perry has written a new memoir um, about his career, friends, lovers, and the big terrible thing, which gives you an idea of where he's going. Um, recovery narratives keep coming down the pike. I mean, I'm 76, I've been hearing them my whole life, but actually they go all the way back to the 19th century when people would give temperance lectures about how they quit drinking and they would get up on a stage and they would talk about all the bad things they did and then how they saw the light of God and then they quit drinking. Uh, transfer into the 20th century, that became the AA narrative. And we just have an endless stream of them. Now, if you're just sitting there, you think, oh, they're all the same. Um, they realize now, not that it was a sin, but it was a disease. And then they quit drinking and everything was hunky-dory. But those narratives never really actually fit that exact paradigm. If you ever go back and see me being interviewed by Oprah, um, I was in a hostile audience. And every single person, I said, tell me your AA story. Not one of them was really, oh, I was really screwing up. Went to AA, stopped drinking, and my life became perfect. Every one of them had some kind of complication. Uh, now that's all changed even more radically. Um, in my memoir, A Scientific Life on the Edge, I review a group of confessionals of different kinds of addictions. First of all, of course, some of them involve overeating, some of them involve sex. So they're We've already gotten out of the whole alcohol model and it, things have become more complex. And in many ways, these new narratives are setting a whole new model of how we think about addiction. So we're gonna talk about Matthew Perry, what he actually says, what people sort of claim he says, and finally, how that's being interpreted by the new drug policy reform movement centering around Medications for opiate use disorder. And by the way, we're gonna we'll end up giving Matthew Perry, not him as a person, but his narrative about addiction and what it meant in his life, a letter grade. I like this idea a lot. And um, so for instance, the temperance standard temperance alcohol, this is how horrible it was in my life. I can never drink again. What letter grade would you give that narrative in terms of how it might help a person listening to it? Well, it's a, a perfect in terms of representing American culture in the 19th century, but now it's become D or worse. I mean, it fits a couple of people. It works for a few people, but everybody, just by the fact that they modify it so much, as like Matthew Perry did, and the MO and the drug policy reform movement is, shows just how poorly it fits reality. So we're running to fix and ratchet out the old recovery narrative to meet the modern era. So you give that standard story a D, not an F? Um, you know, I want to give, there are people who get up, say, oh, I realized drinking was bad for me. I quit and their life improves. The whole underlying framework is bad. It doesn't make sense. And it's harmful to the vast majority of people. So culture-wide, it's not useful. But they can they can have their story. It's okay for them. Um, and not, you and I would never try, you and I would never try to convince somebody who was successfully pursuing that that they shouldn't. Okay, That's so we'll give we'll give them a pass, but it's not a high grade. And so we'll see about Matthew Perry. Now, as far as his Matthew Perry's background goes, he just wrote this book. Um, friends, lovers, and the big terrible thing. And um, he's been on interviews. I saw his interview with Diane Sawyer. Is that who it is on ABC? And um, I've read a few interviews. I think you've read a pretty long, extensive one, which is a pretty good proxy for his book in general. So together we have some knowledge about what is what's in his book, even though neither of us have read it proper. I know a little bit about his upbringing. I'll start there. Uh, his father was John Bennett Perry. He was the Old Spice guy. And that's, I know him as the Old Spice guy. I, I guess he did much more singing and acting. And so Matthew Perry, Chandler from Friends, was born into affluence. I mean, he had a social circle that, and um, 
and a way of life that his parents led for him that gave him some a leg up in the world in some ways. He went to a private school with Justin Trudeau, if that means anything. He was he, he was born, uh, he grew up in Canada. He's Canadian in, in Ottawa. And um, okay, so that's, he's got a leg up. His parents were divorced at some point, which I know weighed heavy on him. And he had some social awkwardness, he said. In fact, I think he said that that character Chandler, even though he got to kind of be part of how that character arced throughout the seasons, it was sort of made for him. Like the so can, can never have silence, has to fill the air. And he said he had the same thing with women and friends um, when he tried to be in a relationship with somebody. He couldn't just let a nice moment be a nice moment. He was always worried. Well, is somebody judging me? If moments go by and there's silence, is is there judgment in the silence? So at, at 14 years old, if I'm rewinding, he said he drank and got drunk for the first time. It was at a party. And he recalls being drunk and thinking, well, this is nice. Like, this must be what normal people feel like all the time. I got to have it. So... There, he recalls starting his drinking, his love for drinking, drinking as a way to solve issues that he wasn't solving otherwise. He was the star of Friends. I'm really jumping ahead. But I'll just say, for all his troubles, even though someone would look at his life and say, kind of lucky life, man. And then he had to reconcile that with not feeling totally lucky all the time. You're only as lucky as you feel and your troubles are as meaningful as you think that they are. He was still an achiever. Like he went, he decided to go to Hollywood, carve himself into a, into the role of Chandler. He wanted to try out for the show and thought, you know, I have my hardships in life that my parents have a, have had a rough go of it. I'm not getting total love from my father all the time. Oh, I think I'm going to go to Hollywood. I got to start my acting career. And uh, when we've talked previously, you mentioned, you know, how many people does their mind go to that first? You know, sometimes it's like, oh, what can I do with my life? So he had some skills and obviously he got the part. So he he really had some skills and he had some confidence because he knew he was going to, he wanted to give his all in getting that part. So besides being on the cast of Friends, which really shot him up to fame, he was a producer of movies. He he wrote them sometimes. He starred in movies. In 1997, he had a, which was a few years into Friends. I think that's like halfway through its um, entire career as a sitcom. He got into a jet ski accident. We already talked about alcohol. At 14 years old, he realized that alcohol is a good solution for some stuff. Well, he got into a jet ski accident. And boy, I hate repeating this because it's hard for me to hear it's so contrived but in his interview with diane sawyer he mentioned and i think in his book he mentioned the doctor gave me a pain prescription for my accident supposed to take one at you know whenever you feel pain it was vicodin and i remember just one pill you know that story and it felt like bliss it felt like you know all the things that uh, Carl Hart says, you know, people say, well, you take one, you take it one time and it's better than sex. And Carl said, I think you need to find a new sexual partner. <laughs> but but that's how he said he felt. And so he began using pills a lot. He began using them in massive quantities, which we'll get into this. But, you know, there's on the one hand, there's the harm that's caused in terms of the cycle you get into thinking you need a pill or needing alcohol for every problem that comes up and not having another strategy. But then there's the physical harm, the toll that it takes when you're taking something that's mostly acetaminophen and a little bit of a psychoactive drug. I mean, that really takes a toll on your body. I think I gave some semblance of background there and a really quick uh, rampage. Want to take it from there? Well, let me try and extricate. He's a remarkable human being. Um, He was a big star on the number one television program for around a decade. And how many people does that happen to? So when you go back in his background, on the one hand, he's privileged. On the other hand, he sort of doesn't feel right about himself. Um, On the other hand, that doesn't stop him 
from being ambitious and excelling. And one of the things that you mentioned, uh, that, that he mentioned, he was a tennis champion in Canada. So he was a good athlete. He's attractive, obviously. And somehow he parlayed his insecurities into a kind of a winning personality, even at the same time that he was feeling insecure about it. Now, he has this narrative, you point out, oh, I took Vicodin, it cured my whole life. But he's already told you that narrative one time before with alcohol at the age of 14. So that's a tried and true narrative. And so he's actually kind of a reflective individual. He points out a lot of interesting things about his life. Um, and at the same time, he squeezes it into the recovery 12-step abstinence disease really doesn't work. So getting back to something you pointed out, how many people who are almost tragically insecure say, you know what, uh, I'm pretty funny. Uh, my father works in Hollywood after he was divorced from his mother. I'm going to go to Hollywood and become a star. Right. And even before Friends, he was on a series. And he was quite successful doing that. And then he heard about friends and they filled all of the major roles. And as you pointed out, he said, Chandler is me. That sounds like that's so self-efficacious. I mean, what human being, he's Canadian, goes to Hollywood, hears about a part in a series that everybody knew was going to be success, says, oh, that part belongs to me. Right. I'm going to get that part. So what you're pointing out is that, uh, you know, I gave a little bit of background, but that wouldn't be a really interesting story. Like to have an interesting memoir, it can't just be, well, I was born here and I had this trouble. And, you know, it's interesting to know about somebody's difficulties. You're getting into the section where almost tangentially in his mind, he's pointing out without drawing too much attention to it, skills, you know, resources that he took hold of. It's nice to have resources and he didn't even get to choose that he had the great resources he had. And on the other hand, he took the reins of those resources and rode them to somewhere productive. He had skills. He was an attractive guy, but he was good looking, introspective, good actor. He, I don't know if you got to this part yet. Oh, I mean, he's athletic. He was a tennis star. He worked hard. I mean, you don't. Get... And he has a good narrative. He tells a good story. He's a guy who knows how to, which is what this is about. Right. So we're reading, I mean, what percentage of people become addicted? And of that group of people, what percentage of them become virtually one of the leading media stars in the United States? Ah. And the answer is one thousandth of one percent. But we don't care about all the other ones. Right. So Matthew Perry is doing Matthew Perry in his memoir. Mm -hmm. It's another Matthew Perry star turn. And he gets that role. And throughout his narrative, he under he undercuts the whole 12 step thing. Um, being cast on friends like us, that's what it was called originally, caused him to stop drinking as much. Quote, I had a life changing job that I had to help, desperately wanted to report to in the morning. So I drank far less than usual. Uh, and he said after the first table read, the cast knew that they were in the middle of fame. So the narrative, the whole 12 step narrative, he undercuts from the start. That's yeah. That's so interesting. <laughs> I, I, I and I'm going to add that in his book, whether it's true or not, you got to take him at his word, because what do we know? He said that in the midst of, in the throes of, and in the worst parts of his addiction, he was drinking all the time, doing pills all the time, doing both back and forth. He set a, a really rigid guideline for himself never to use substances or drink while he was on the set. And he said it was like, Pretty tough. He'd come in really hungover, hardly able to see. But by the time the camera was rolling, he got it done. And he was glad that he set that guideline for himself. 
And so my question about the thing that you brought up that, you know, he had a problem drinking, but he said it kind of tempered my drinking to be able to to know that I had something that was worth getting up in the morning for and to temper it for. And then even when it was in his worst moments on the sets of friends, he'd be able to say, all right, I, I love drinking. I love drugs and it, it's helpful to me, but I can't do it on set. That's a rule for myself. It's a value. I, I want to ask, you know, if he's here, I want to ask, how the hell did you do that? I mean, you said you had this progressive disease that's controlling you. He even used the old adage that it's doing uh, one arm push-ups in the parking lot every time he thinks he's got it under control. How did he set up a value system for himself that allowed him to say, I'm going to not drink so much because I care about this show, or I'm going to not drink and do drugs, even though that's what I do every day, because I care about the, the friends thing. And remember with the alcohol, he actually cut back. He, he would get kicked out of a 12-step meeting. He would say, oh, when I started drinking excessively, um, I realized that when I had to do a part, I cut back my drinking. You're not allowed to say that. Hmm. And, you know, the first thing you have to say is that I've lost control. You're not allowed to say, oh, well, I ne really wanted this gig. So I never took drugs when I went to perform dur during my show. You've described having that same debate with people where you never took drugs during your period when you were going to work. And it's sort of almost like you're getting in an argument with a the person. They're sort of saying, well, that's not possible. Yeah. And then you're going, well, I'm only telling, you know, your story is you couldn't not take drugs no matter what. I'm just telling you what my story, why is my story not true? And so throughout, he shows a lot of insight. Um, and he, he uh, and at the same time, he has to shoehorn himself in as you described when he took the Vicodin, I swear to God, I think that if I had never taken it, none of the next three decades would have gone the way they did. So let's kind of jump ahead to sort of talk about what the next three decades were. He became a superstar. Um, when you're a superstar, you know, you make a lot of money. He's a very wealthy man. And um, at the same time, he would periodically check into rehab during the show. And one of the big things about, that we'll get back into is how many times he was in rehab and he spent millions of dollars. Um, he went into rehab and it kept failing. And, it, and when did it fail? Uh, after starring in the box office, after Friends, he kept writing, he kept producing, he kept acting. Willis asked Perry to reprise his role in the sequel, The Whole Ten Yards Bomb. That was the moment Hollywood decided to no longer invite Mr. Perry to be in movies, he wrote. Perry said he began drinking and using drugs again, but sobered up so he could resume auditioning. What kind of a story is he telling about himself, about his career and interaction with the drug and alcohol thing? What's what the, kind of story does he mean to tell about himself? Or well, you're kind of talk, you talk he? about two columns. There's a column of drug use and there's a column <laughs> of career. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I think his whole memoir is. There's He's trying, he says he's trying to tell a recovery story. And then, like, let's put my specifics into the, the recovery story. And what, the way that I actually visualize his narrative is that, yeah, right, there, there are kind of two columns and he is running them parallel to each other. There's a recovery story column where he says, you need rehab, you need to acknowledge your disease, you have to admit you're powerless. There's no, you can't really control it. You can only, you know, succumb, succumb to a higher power and hope that the recovery movement will lead you. And the other column is like, this is my life. These are my skills. These are my interests. Isn't this cool? Isn't this interesting? I'm being, being introspective. And I don't know if this is accidental or on purpose, but he's sometimes, even though they seem to be running totally parallel to each other, not interacting, it's like, oh, whoops, I connected the two. You know, I connected the two in terms of I use my skills or values to get myself out of this situation. That's kind of like recovery. They go together. And I think if I were being uh, 
if I were asking him thoughtful, open-ended questions, I might ask him, what's up with you connecting your life and like the natural things that you do to make yourself a better person or improve? How can you connect that with the recovery story? Does that, does that really square? And I and don't know what you would to say. try and help him as a coach. We would say, able to quit the drugs and alcohol hmm. and that's when he was engaged in something that was working and he was feeling successful and when did you relapse that's when you know everybody who goes the biggest stars in hollywood they're going to have down periods i mean bruce willis has never been as big a star as he was and it's then that he relapses it's the connection between his life and his habit, which he's constantly, or his addictions, he's constantly making that connection without making it explicit. And so if we were coaching him, that's how we would, that's how the connection that we would make, because those, that kind of awareness en enables you um, to really proceed in life. Um, and he hit a down spot. He's always working. He's always trying to succeed. Uh, Mr. Sunshine premiered in 2011, but was canceled after one season, despite putting my entire self into it. You know, he doesn't sound like an addicted person. Mm -hmm. He really tried. The show was a big success for about two weeks before everyone in the world decided they didn't want to watch it. Um, he did another show, Go On. Yet with another show I was leaving, leading open huge and got canceled with nothing to do and no one to love, I relapsed one more time. That's not an AA story. Um, he's And he's constantly trying to short circuit the way he's reacting to life by going to rehab. So finally, this is his recovery story, which they would never let you tell in AA. Uh, he's, he's, he was in rehab, I don't know, nine or 12 times. Perry said that his therapist helped him quit using drugs by telling him to associate them with the colostomy bag he had been using on and off since his colon exploded. I have not been interested in taking a drug since he wrote. Quitting smoking was not as simple. He went to the doctor because he was wheezing, but Perry eventually turned to a hypnotist to help him Hypnotism worked until all of his top teeth fell out and he began smoking again to cope with the pain. But he added that ultimately he was able to quit. I no longer felt the need to automatically light up a cigarette to go with my morning coffee. He's talking about a life process, the ups and downs of it, what he used drugs for, why he turned to them in some moments of pain, why they produced more pain, and how he eventually came to grips with all of that. Um, and so it's the op, it's a life process program story and really not a disease story. Um, he still hasn't put it all together though. He shared that he longs for a partner and children. He wrote that his friends and family have known there's a brightness about him that they have never seen before. So we're thinking good things about him. But that's the point at which the book ends. Now, I turned to a New York Times interview with him. His demeanor brightened when he talked about pickleball, his latest obsession. He built a court at the house he's moving into in the Palisades. He plays with friends and hired pros. He said, I thought it would be a good idea to pump myself up to play pickleball before this interview. But basically, I'm about to fall asleep in your lap. So at the time he's interviewed in the New York Times, he's been what they call sober for 18 months. He's in the new plateau. And he tends to be a little obsessive. He's playing a lot of pickleball. But remember, he was a national champion tennis player mm -hmm. connecting up. He's got, he's got a house on the Palisades with a pool, and he's building a pickleball court. You and I, we can't even imagine the amount of resources you have to control to be able to do that. It's worth 120 million in the first place. So if we're thinking, oh, this is a great recovery story. Let's go into Appalachia with all those, you know, uh, Vicodin addicts. 
you know, it's 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 like a punchline of a bad joke. Well, when you build your place on the Palisades, include a pickleball court. <laughs> And what we would say is he's able to get totally engaged in an activity that cooks up to something he's done in the past that he's good at. That's good for him. He's got enough money to hire pros and he's got friends that he can play with. He's got so many resources and assets, so many foundational values, so much ambition, so many skills that if anybody's going to recover, it's him. But then the question becomes, what is the basis of his recovery? And that's what we're discussing here. How do people recover? And his answer is, despite his constant failures, well, it's this whole 12-step thing. And you and I, based on the Life Process Program, look at it from an entirely different direction, a way of him marshalling and getting a grounding in life based on everything he's done before, all of the assets he brings to the table and his motivation and ability to, and desire to move forward. Now, I think he still, his, he has some self-fulfilling beliefs that I think still make things hard for him, but he has the, the bulwark against something bad happening of having $120 million, having the ability to have burned $9 million on failed rehab attempts and to build, to literally build the kind of life he wants for himself in his home and have the people he wants to have around, um, and, you know, have good friendships and good activities. He even does harm reduction, where uh, at the end of some of his interviews, he said, I like to reward myself for hard work. It's not the healthiest, but I like tapioca pudding. So I'll probably go eat one of those at the end. That, that's total harm reduction. That's a nice replacement activity. So he's got, he's got a lot, but he, he believes that he can't ever drink again and power to him. You know, that's the choice he wants to make. He doesn't want to drink and that works in his life. Um, but he believes it like religiously. Like if I ever drink again, it's all downhill. He doesn't think if I ever drink again, whoopsie, but you know, I still have this life that I've built. And I think that that is holding him back. So his narrative is look how 12 steps and abstinence saved me. Mm -hmm. And actually, the most remarkable thing about his narrative is that he spent $10 million on rehabs, <laughs> and they all failed. Right. And once again, remember, he is hearkening back to alcohol. Because I, uh, 12 Steps does drugs, but alcohol is its favorite thing. It comes out of temperance. So let's flash forward to the future, to the constant, the presence. I get periodic emails. In my memoir, I say something like, save me from the people who are my own fans. And there's a person I'm in touch with, who from time to time writes me. And this person wrote me about the Times interview. And her point was, oh, I put down 12 step recovery programs. And isn't this a perfect example? It's a recovery 12-step story, which is sad because he should have tried medication for opioid addiction. It might have saved him some of the $9 million he spent on abstinence-based rehab resorts. And he wants to help drug users. As you point out in one of your books, the people with the least capacity to handle drugs are then held up as role models when they quit are in recovery. So how is she reacting to his story in terms of where I'm coming from? You're a non 12 step guy. He's a 12 step guy. The ultimate non 12 step thing is medication assisted therapy or MOUD, medication for opioid use disorder. And of course, I don't know, maybe that's an answer or something to an opioid addiction, but it's certainly not an answer to the, the fundamentals that underlie a, an alcohol addiction or the lifestyle of an addiction in the first place. And talking, you talked about the two columns. There's two columns here. There's 12-step recovery. I'm not that. And then there's harm reduction, for which for this person means M-O-U-D. He should have realized that abstinence wasn't the route to go. He should have taken buprenorphine or methadone, and then he would have been fine. And this person believes that this is my natural way of thinking. Well, the visual, I, I've said this before, the visual that I like to think about for this 
in my free associative mind is the, the Carl Sagan story about characters in one and two dimensions. And the characters that live in a two dimensional space can't fathom what it would even mean, look like, be like for there to be a third dimension. It's just not even built into their understanding of things. And I think that that's what this is. The idea that if you're not all abstinence, well, you must be like a medication assisted treatment kind of a guy. But there's no third dimension in that way of thinking that, well, can it be possible that medication assisted treatment without anything else, the, the whole narrative that you have to spend when you give somebody a replacement pill, couldn't that be kind of like 12 steps in the sense that you're saying you're powerless, but for this pill? And, I th- and your, your broader way of thinking about that is no matter what a person does to get themselves to the other side of things, it can't be a single easy solution. It can't have within a pill or a small or ideology soundbite or something, all of the answers. It has to be contextual and relevant to the person's life and they have to build up their lives and they have to do that work, you know, in their own realm. And that's what the life process program is about recalling people's values, honing in on their positive experiences and helping them to get a sound footing in the world. If you look at Matthew Perry's life, he's gotten himself to a pretty good place where he can lead a stable existence. That's a good place not to take destructive drugs and drinking during. And that's that's the answer. That's we that's the foundational way that people achieve recovery. Now you interview Maya Salovitz and you sort of tease her a little bit. Maya, of course, went way overboard in her early 20s and was shooting up heroin and cocaine. And somewhere, and she went 12 step rehab. Somewhere along the line, she started drinking wine. And then you tantalize her a little bit by saying, well, what if you took a painkiller now? (laughs) And then she says something like, well, I'm not going to shoot up heroin now. Right. (laughs) She's a world famous lecturer. But you could say, if you shot up heroin, you'd go down to 85 pounds and become a speed addict, uh, a heroin cocaine addict again. Is that, do you really believe that? And she doesn't really believe that. But she might say, why would I do that? Yeah. And we're, okay. We understand that people make all kinds of life sacrifices. So what has happened in the world, the recovery narrative has changed. Uh, Matthew Perry is doing, you asked me the grade, his recovery narrative is a B minus. It's got a lot of important elements in there but he squishes it into the typology of AA and it doesn't work. People who read it kind of say, the story doesn't totally make sense. He's put, he spent $9 million unsuccessfully going into 12 step rehabs and he's telling everybody, well, that's the way everybody should go. That doesn't work. Unfortunately, the alternative model that has now come into place, which bears the label harm reduction with which I'm associated, you know, I'm I'm fine with, you know, Maya smoking some pot or taking whatever antidepressant she does and drinking. And I don't believe if she somehow got in a room where they made her take some heroin or if she got run over by a car and they gave her some kind of powerful narcotic that she was going to stop being this Maya Solovitz and go back and be the old Maya Solovitz. Mm-hmm. I don't she's a different human being and she's come to a different place in life. And that is the underlying source of recovery. And it's so crucial to recognize that when you look at Matthew Perry's recovery story, you say, yeah, he's got a pretty good shot at recovery. He's an incredibly famous, skilled, rich person. If that's what we're counting on, recovery, you know, we're going to get, he's one in a million. We have to have a method of getting into people's lives and helping them establish their grounding in life, their footing, recapturing or tuning into their values and developing purpose. And so 
the new recovery narrative is represented by this person's letter to me about how Matthew Perry would have succeeded, unlike the story he told, if he only would have taken M-O-U-D, that's the lesson that's been learned, which is the wrong lesson. So you give Matthew Perry's narrative a B minus, but all, all said. Uh, let, let's t- tell me what you think about this. I think that I give, uh, thinking about my two columns that I think he, he demonstrated in his book, I give his understanding of what addiction and recovery means, I give it an F. But I give his story about his life and the elements that actually wind up being hugely salient in terms of his recovery process, I'll give that an A minus. And if I average them together, he gets a C minus for me. And I think if we average if we average our grades together, he gets a what does that mean? He gets a C. I don't know if that would you works. Give, what grade would you give that email from that uh, harm reduction drug policy reform expert? I would give that a B minus. <laughs> because it's not, I mean, that's a person who's thinking beyond, you know, people are totally powerless in their lives, but doesn't realize she's not thinking beyond people are totally powerless in their lives. So I don't know. It gets, I, I, I've seen, I can, the, the reason. For Matthew Perry, <clears throat> harm reduction for you and me means not focusing on what substance you're taking or the mechanics you use to overcome your addiction, which vary all over the lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, People quit. She may not realize you're one of them. People quit heroin addictions all the time. Yeah. They've been doing it for time immemorial before methadone. Um, There's nothing magical that just come down the pike and which she seems to feel. Well, buprenorphine, what a great discovery. And of course, methadone has been around forever. And people have always been able to quit addictions, and they do so in terms of the alternative structure and values, like Matthew Perry. I want to be successful. I want to do well in my acting role. I want people to respect me. And that's having those extra dimensions in your life is what allows people to recover. And by missing, this is an opportunity. Matthew Perry's one example, um, the whole rejection of the 12-step abstinence model is a whole opportunity to grasp a new reality. And this person in that letter is missing the boat and rejecting that opportunity to learn the essential truths about addiction. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm just thinking that Matthew Perry's book, if I live in Appalachia or inner city Baltimore for that matter, and I'm reading that book, what I see is a the, the blueprint I see that he's given me is you got to keep trying, got to keep trying, got to keep going to rehab, got to keep trying. And hopefully you'll land on, you know, some of these specific things that I've landed on. I'm pretty lucky. That's not going to work. That's not a good blueprint. But they, if you read between the lines and the subtext and the accidental blueprint that he's created, it's something more like if you can, if you can get a handle on what your resources and skills and interests are and provide a value driven life for yourself, then, then you can hang in there despite your, you know, attempts at rehab or belief that you're. And people do that all the time. Mm-hmm. We don't read books uh, like Matthew Perry's. You and I reviewed the movies they're called a beautiful boy. And yeah. the punchline of that is how do you recover from, he had a meth prob addiction. Oh, you write bestsellers. And right. the consult in the addiction theory, and you go into Baltimore and tell people our trick, the trick of the drug policy reform movement, it's not a trick. The fundamentals of the life process program is to be able to reach people where they're at, to tie into the fact that they're not going to be a star of friends, but yet they've got enough resources, values, capacity, and foundation in life to recover none, to put this together, to give them the grounding to recover in their in their place and time. Beautifully put. You give Matthew Perry's narrative a B minus, I give it a C minus, we're, we're calling it a C. And that email that uh, that came in, we're, we're gonna give that an I for incomplete and we'll we'll check back at a later we're time. Gonna her, we're gonna give her a break. We're gonna yeah. hope that she can learn. <laughs> All, All right. right.
thank you again for uh, for doing this on a Sunday, truthfully. Sunday proper. Good to see you. Bye, Zach. All right, take care.